uh, coming together to learn a little bit in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. As I mentioned uh, last week, uh, this year particularly, I think we make, need to make an extra effort to get ourselves in the zone for Rosh Hashanah because we're not going to have the communal support that we usually get by being able to go to a wonderful shul with hundreds of people and beautiful shliach tzibor and singing together. It's unlikely, we're not sure exactly what form Rosh Hashanah will take this year, but it's unlikely to be as powerful um, as, uh, uh, as usual. So it will depend on everybody making some preparations, get hold of a good machsa with some good beforeshim, and uh, see if you can make Rosh Hashanah uh, um, meaningful. Uh, so just to rem remind you, last week we focused on the shofar, and I explained how the significance of the shofar, the Rambam, famous Rambam of Uru Yusheni Mishinaschem, the idea of the wake-up call, which we'll come back to, please God, next week. Um, and uh, also, in general, I spoke about the shofar as being a, uh, a dialogue between us and HaKadosh Baruch. That actual fact that Takiya is a sound which comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which comes from the Ein Seif, the Takiya is meant to represent something completely pure, infinite, and unbroken, the pure neshama that comes into this world that everybody has. That's how it starts. That's the neshama from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the sound from God. The Takiya is the sound from God. And then the Teruah is our sound. We understand we're living in an imperfect world, a broken world, a difficult world. And, and uh, that is, and, and on Rosh Hashanah, we are in trepidation. And actually the sounds of the broken sound of the Shefer represent that Yira, the Eimat Hadin, the, the trepidation of the day of the day. And then the final uh, uh, Tekiah is is the Takiya of uh, Yemosa Moshiach, Takah B'Shev HaGod HaLechei Rosenu, that it's the moment of uh, bringing the world once again to be a world which is unified uh, around Emuna and, and Yerushalayim and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, our vision of the Messianic period. So that is really, uh, um, and we say two brachas, if you remember, I'm just spending two minutes uh, reviewing last week's year, we say two brachas. The first bracha is lishma kol shofar, that we are listening. So we are listening primarily to the sound of the shofar from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is the sound of Har Sinai. That is the uh, shofar that we are listening to. And then in Ashwana Esra, we say ki atosha mea kol shofar. We want HaKadosh Baruch Hu to hear our shofar, which is the teruah. So we're having a, a, a dialogue between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and, and, and the Jewish people. I'd like to just add to that something I didn't mention last week, which is a very beautiful midrashic um, uh, basis for this idea that I've just mentioned to you, and that is that the Midrash says on Parshas Yisro, it's Parshas Yisro where we find uh, the Sinai experience accompanied by the Shefa, and there it's Kol Shefa Holech V'chozek, and at one point Rashi says something extraordinary. Rashi says, that the shofar that was heard at Har Sinai was, was the, uh, a sh the ram's horn of the ram that was offered up in Akedas Yitzcha. Now, of course, this is a Midrashic idea. That doesn't mean literally. We have to know how to learn Midrash, ladies and gentlemen. Midrash is always very profound and truthful, but not meant to be taken literally. The Midrash is a metaphor. Midrash is literature. So Midrash is telling us something very profound and saying that the sound of the Shefer and Har Sinai was rooted in the Akedas Yitzchak uh, experience. The Akedas Yitzchak was the moment of the purest form of, of Emunah and dedication of Abram and Yitzchak, and that's indeed why we read it on, on Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, we are listening to the Shefer from the Ayil Shal Yitzchak, and that's why the Mishnah says actually in Rosh Hashanah that even though uh, the Shefer for many animals is Kasha, but Mitzvoso Ba'ayil. As a special mitzvah to use a ram's horn rather than the horn of, of, of a goat or something like that because of this connection to Akedas Yitzchak. But Rashi says that the, uh, that the uh, uh, shefer of, the, um, uh, of, of Har Sinai was in fact the horn of that, of that ram. In other words, metaphorically, that ram's horn. But if you look at the source of Rashi, which is the medrash, which, which is called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, the Medrash says that actually both horns of the ram of Yitzchok are used, says the Medrash there. 
the first horn was used at Sinai, and the other horn will be used at Yemosa Mashiach, the Kabbalah for God of Achirusenu, says Pirkei Drabeliezer, will be the second horn of the Akedas Yitzchak. In other words, this Akedas Yitzchak was a seminal moment, was a pivotal moment where, where, where levels of Yerat Shamayim and Emuna were reached, which created the foundation both for Sinai and for Yemosa Mashiach, and both of them come together with Tkiah Shefa. The Tkiah Shefa brings us together with Sinai, the first Tkiah, Yemosa Mashiach, the last Tkiah, and our Yiras Hadin, standing before our Kodesh Baruch Hu, the Teru in the middle, and these should be some of the thoughts that accompany us while we're listening uh, uh, to the show. Okay, and now we're moving on, and I'd like to look today at a couple of other very important um, ideas. Uh, the first one is the idea of Yom Hazikaron, that Chazal refer to the day of Rosh Hashanah as Yom Hazikaron. Um, and in actual fact, uh, this is not completely a creation of Chazal, uh, because the Rosh Hashanah itself, as I showed you a couple of weeks ago, is referred to twice in the Torah, once in Emor and once in Pinchas. And in one place it's called Yom Teruah, but in the other place it's called Yom Zichron Teruah. But it's not only the Teruah that's happening, but there's something about Zichronot. What does Zichronot here mean? So the simple meaning is Zichronot means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers us. But in actual fact, if you think about it a bit more deeply, the idea that HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers us shouldn't be such a great surprise. And it's not such a big chiddush. Of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu with infinite knowledge and infinite power and infinite uh, uh, existence. Of course, he remembers everything that happens. What is it really we're davening for on Rosh Hashanah um, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should remember us? I'd like you to have a look at this text just for a minute, because this is quite important in terms of understanding our davening. Can you see a text, Ali? Can you see a text? Yes? Yes? Good. Excellent. So let's just go for, I'll come back to all this in a bit, in a minute, but let's just go here for a minute to our Musaf. In our Musaf, we have uh, three central brachas, which I'll refer to a bit later on. The first one is called Malchius, right? Malchiot, which is the, the references to Hashem Melech. The second one is Zichronot, referencing HaKadosh Baruch who's remembering us. And the third one is Shofarot. So I'm now going... So these are the three central brachas of the Musaf. But in the, in the Zichronot uh, part of the uh, Shema Esra, so we start off by simply stating as a fact, Ato Zochem Maaseh Of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers every, everything that was ever done in, 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 in world history is recorded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is remembered by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's all there. Incidentally, maybe I'll just uh, add here, an experience that I had in my life, which gave me an additional understanding of this particular idea of Rosh Hashanah and Atah Zecha Maaseh Odom, and I think maybe it's an experience that all of you can, can relate to. About three or four years ago in London, uh, somebody stole uh, my iPhone. Now, you know, in the world we live in today, there's no greater tragedy uh, than losing your, your phone. It's almost most unthinkable. It's almost it's, 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 it's shiver, really, on losing your phone because you've lost all your contacts and all your data and all your, all your information and your calendar and everything, your banking, everything is lost. Anyhow, terrible, terrible, terrible. What I did was I went to the, I went to the shop. There's a point to this story. Hold on a second. I go, to, I go to the Apple shop to buy a new Apple. A new Apple. So this, this uh, salesman shows me, the thing, asks me what model I want, et cetera, et cetera. Very nice. And then I said, say to him, well, what, what are we going to do about all my data, everything that I've ever done, all the messages and the WhatsApp? He says, it's all in the cloud. Everything you have ever done, everything you have ever done is in the cloud. Nothing is lost. I said, really? I, I, never, did, I never backed up the phone even once. Because the phone is cleverer than you. The phone backs itself up on a regular basis. It's all in the cloud. So I said, what, all my emails, all my WhatsApps, all my photos, all, everything is in the cloud? He said, and I said, what about my old phone? My old phone's running around somewhere. Someone's got it with all, no. He says, we are going to wipe your old phone. Remotely, we can wipe your old phone. And your new phone is going to have all your new data. 
And sure enough, I bought the phone, he plugged it in, in the shop, and in front of my eyes in 20 minutes, all my photos, all my emails, all my WhatsApps, everything was restored into the phone. And I was thinking to myself, Ato Zoiche Masa Odom or Poke all everything that you've ever done, right, is recorded in the cloud. He said to me, just by the way, he says, even things you think you've deleted are recorded in the cloud. You better be careful what you put on your phone. Don't think that things that are deleted are really deleted. They're just deleted from the machine, but actually they're still up there in the cloud. And anyone who wants to retrieve, who knows how to retrieve them, can retrieve them. Everything is recorded. So we have, Baruch Hashem, with our new cell phone technology, a, a new, a new marshal. We don't need to go to ancient Midrashic Mashalim. I think the new marshal of everything recorded in the cloud, I don't even know where this cloud is. I don't even know what a cloud means, I'll be quite honest with you. But uh, I see lots of clouds in my life. But I'm not sure exactly which one of them contains uh, hundreds of billions of pieces of information. But I call Bonin, it's somewhere out there, it's all recorded. And the idea that everything that imagine on Rosh Hashanah, Akash Baruch, who plays back the cloud recording of the whole, you know, every single detail, even the bits you think you've deleted, except that the Chidush is, in terms of Rosh Hashanah, that Akash Baruch, who believes in tshuva, and tshuva means that it's really deleted. Tshuva means that something that you really regret, and and you really would prefer not have to, not to have done out of which you do tshuva, that's a really, really deleted, even more, even more deleted than, than pressing the, the delete button um, on your phone. Anyhow, that's my marshal. If you want to know a model, a modern medrash for the 21st century, that is the medrash for Rosh Hashanah and for zichronot. So zichronot means everything is remembered, okay? So here it is. Maybe we can find a gematria here somewhere in, for Zichronot and an iPhone. Maybe we have to figure out a, 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 a gematria for iPhone and see whether we can figure it in anyhow. But what's interesting here is, of course, Akadosh Baruch remembers, but then we ask for the following. This is our main central request from Akadosh Baruch Hu on Rosh Hashanah. And that is, Alakeinu Malakea Vaseinu, Zohreinu Bazikoreim Toiv Lefonel. Now, what does that mean? Remember us positively. Remember us gracefully. Remember us uh, forgivingly. What does it mean? Either I can remember remembers everything, in which case he remembers the bad and the good, which obviously is the case. What does it mean, remember us well? What, what could it mean, Zachreinu, Bazikora, and Tov, Lefonecha? That he should, should remember us is, in, 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 in the best way possible. If he remembers everything, he remembers the good and the bad. What does it mean to remember the best? So I'd just like to speak about that for a minute because that is so central to Rosh Hashanah. So the idea is as follows. We tend to think about memory, that memory is like the memory on the iPhone. It simply remembers everything and that's it. But actual fact, in terms of human life, the act of memory, of remembering, is an act of Bechira is an act of choice. What do I mean by that? Let's say you've been, I don't know, for five or 10 years uh, employed in a business, or you've been uh, in a school or in a marriage or whatever, and somebody asks you, what do you remember? What do you remember from the last 10, from the 10 years that you spent in this school, or the last 10 years you spent in this marriage, or you spent in this, you spent in this, in this business? What, what do you remember from the 10 years? So when you think to remember, let's say 10 years you spent in a school, you've got a choice. You can either remember all the very annoying and upsetting and stupid events, that's what you can remember, or you can remember the wonderful moments. There were wonderful moments, moments of friendship, moments of inspiration, moments of, of goodwill, moments of maturity. There were, there were good moments and there were bad moments. The question is, what do you want to remember? That's it. What do you want to remember? Do you want to remember the good? So Chazal have got a phrase which they call ayin tova. Ayin tova means to want to remember the good and not to want to remember the bad, right? In every marriage, there are happy moments and annoying moments. And then you've got to decide for yourself, what do you want to remember? If you want to remember the happy moments, then you'll be a happy person. If you want to remember the annoying moments, you'll spend your whole life being annoyed by the annoying moments. But it's, a, it's an act of Bechira. You can choose. What do you want to remember? 
And let's just take that one level deeper. When you decide to remember, let's say, the good that happened in the school for 10 years, the good events, the inspiration, the, the, the friendship, the ideas, what are you really doing when you remember the good? What you're really saying is, in essence, I believe this was a good place. It was a good place and gave me positive uh, 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 learning and friendship and maturity. And that was, it was a good place. Were there also bad things that happened? Yes, they were, but those things happened because, for, for extenuating circumstances. Those, those things were not really part of the essence of the place. By choosing to remember, you're choosing actually to remember, you're, you're making a value decision. What really was the essence of that 10 years experience? What was the essence of it? In other words, there is the difference, what the, what the morale difference, between, there are some things which are atzmi and some things which are mikri. In, in every event, in every object, there are atzmi qualities and mikri qualities. Atzmi means part of the essence, and mikri means accidental things which happen to be like that, but they could have been different. So by remembering the good things, you're actually saying, I remember this was a good experience. And this person who I spent 10 years with was a good person. Were there annoying moments? Yes, there were. But you know what? That happened for, for, all, for a whole variety of, of different, uh, different extenuating uh, reasons. But in essence, it was good. So this is really what we're asking from our Kodesh Baruch. We're asking from our Kodesh Baruch Hu, Zachreinu B'zikaron Tov L'fonel. Please remember all the mitzvahs that I've done. Remember the chesed that I've done. And what I'm really saying when I'm davening, and this you should have in mind when you're davening a Rosh Hashanah, when you say, we're saying to God, look, I've learned Torah, I've done mitzvahs, I've done some davening. Have I, also, have I also done things that I'm not particularly proud of? Yes, I have, but that wasn't really me. That wasn't the real me. The real me is the good things that I've done. That's really what I want you to remember I want you to try and focus on the, all the good things that I've done. Remember us for the good things that we've done. Everybody has done mitzvahs, right? The Gemara says, Even people who think they are reikonim, people who think, ah, what have I got? I'm, I'm, I'm empty. Reikonim from the word reik. People who think they're empty, in actual fact, on closer inspection, a malayim mitzvahs karima and are filled with mitzvahs like a pomegranate is filled with seeds. Right? It's one of the reasons that we have the pomegranate on Rosh Hashanah is because of this Maima Chazal. The Chazal is saying that even people who might appear to be reikanim, might appear to be empty of spiritual content, it's not true. They've done lots of chesed, they've said brachas, they've kept Shabbos, They've done mitzvahs, they've kept Pesach, they, they, they've done Malayan mitzvahs, Karima, they've done millions of mitzvahs, right? So we mustn't underestimate ourselves, we mustn't undervalue ourselves. We must say to Baruch please remember the good things that I've done, and that's the real me. The things that I've done wrong happened because I was angry, I was impatient, I was under pressure. I, I, I didn't focus, I forgot certain things, right? What Chazal say, Ein odom chote, elo imke nichnas bo ruach shtus. The idea of a ruach shtus, ruach shtus, shtuyot, right? Sometimes a person gets into his hand, shtuyot, what we call a fantasy, and because of that, you do silly things, right? But that's not the real you. The real you is the mitzvahs and the Torah that you've done. So really, this is actually a very important and interesting uh, um, part of our davening, that we daven to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we say, Zachreinu b'zikhoroin toiv lefonecho. Remember us for all the good things that we've done, because that's the real person that I am. And that's the person that I want to be, and that's the person I want to be remembered by, and, that's, and, that, is, and that is who I want to be as I'm standing before you on the Yom Adip. Or for example, it, uh, and the Tefillah then continues, Uzzachor lono Hashem lekeinu is habris, so we're saying, remember Avraham Avinu, and remember, even though Avraham Avinu was a great man, even he had mo greater moments and lesser moments. So what was the peak, the peak moment of Avraham Avinu, right? The greatest Jew, 
and the progenitor of the Jewish people. And what was his greatest moment? His, his moment of fame was Bahara Maria, was, was the Akedas Yitzchak. Remember him then. In other words, that is really who we are. We want to be considered to be. Uh, um, we want to. We want to to consider us to be descendants of that moment, and that's why we are laying that on Rosh Hashanah, the Akedah, and that's got to do with. And, and the Shofar connects to that aisle. The ram's horn of the, of the Akeda is a way of, so to speak, reminding Akadosh Baruch Hu that we have this tremendous positive potential and also reminding ourselves, as I said, the, the, the Shafa is for, for Akadosh Baruch Hu to hear and for us to hear. Who are we? We are descendants of Ram Avinu who did this great mitzvah of Akeda Yitzchak. And that is our, in a sense, our, our claim to fame. Okay, so this really, when we say Yom Hazikoroin, idea of the Yom HaZikaron is it's a day where we are remembered L'toy. We are remembered for, for our, our, our positive side, and that's what we are asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, uh, to, to um, on the Yom HaDin. That's what we're asking him to remember. Excuse me just one second. For some reason my... Uh... Okay. So I'd like to start, or I'd like to now go back and look at one of the most beautiful parts of our tefillah, which contains another important uh, principle of Rosh Hashanah. And here I have highlighted at the beginning of the sheet that in fact, Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of mankind. What does this mean? So we, we, we are referring a few times in our tefillah to the significance of Rosh Hashanah, that Rosh Hashanah is an anniversary of the creation of the world, but in actual fact, it's not the creation of Barashis Borah Lakim. It's not the creation of day one. It's a creation of day six. On day six, mankind uh, was, um, was created. Incidentally, just want to mention as a sort of a footnote here, that I'm, I've often been asked over the years, uh, on the question of the age of the universe. As we all know, science tells us that the age of the universe is over uh, 13 uh, uh, million years, uh, more than that, uh, billions of years, the galaxies, etc. And we are saying that it's 5,780 years old. So there are lots of different ways to look at this. Um, but even if we completely accept science, it is still absolutely credible uh, to see that there's no contradiction here at all for the simple reason that the first six days of creation are unlikely to have been six 24-hour periods. Because the six days were, could have been six, there were six eras, six different stages in the creation. And each stage could have been a million years or a billion years with as many dinosaurs and peridoctyls as you care to have flying around the world. And that's fine. That's not a contradiction to our belief in Barashas Baralakim. Akadosh Baruch who created uh, a world in, in six stages, not in six days. The greatest proof, incidentally, that the days were not 24-hour periods is that this, the solar system, the sun and the moon, are only created on day four. So there is no sense, you couldn't even measure 24-hour periods without a solar system. In the absence of a solar system, there's no way that anybody or one, one could even conceive of a 24-hour period. So these periods were millions or billions of years, right? But one thing is, one thing we do have as our tradition, which is not refuted by science, which is 5,780 years. That is the amount of years, not since the beginning of the creation of the universe, but from the beginning of the creation of the Tselem Elohim, from the beginning of the creation of man and woman, of mankind was created 5,780 years ago. It's the anniversary of day six, and that's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the day where we commemorate not the creation of the, of, of the animal kingdom and the plant life and, and, the, and the constellations, because in actual fact, all of that is part of the magnificent uh, God's creation, but the, the real essence and the purpose of creation was only in the creation of mankind and the creation of somebody who had a neshama, a tselem, a tselem elokim. 
At that moment, when the Tzalem and a kid, when a human being with a spiritual potential and a spiritual awareness and consciousness came into being, that was the beginning of the Jewish world. So we are counting 5,780 years of mankind, of, of mankind with a spiritual uh, a theme to it, right? Uh, and in actual fact, and that's the significance of Rosh Hashanah. And that's what we mean. So in, on Rosh Hashanah, we, we, we hear the shofar uh, twice, just to remind you. We hear the shofar before we start Musaf. We hear 30 sounds of the, the shofar. And then we hear again the shofar during Musaf. And during Musaf, we hear it three times with 10 sounds each time. And each time after we have heard the shofar, we say these words. And I find these words to be extremely powerful. And it starts off with this word, Hayom Haras Elam. And the word Haras comes from the word Herayon, which means uh, pregnancy and conception. Right? Today the world was created. This was the birth of the world. We say Hayom Haras Elam. Today, on this day, the first of Tishri, Right, the the uh, from the very very first of Tishri, right? the uh, the uh, the posuk uh, which we read uh, a few weeks ago that Eini Akharish Baruch Hu Bo May Rashis Hashana Ad Acharis Shana that every year has got a Rashis and an Acharis and the uh, and the Kabbalists say that the word Rashis Rash Ayin Shin Yud Taf actually is an anagram of the word Aleph Tishri. The word Aleph Tishri is those letters rearranged contain the word Rashis. I'm not quite sure why this has come up on my screen. Checking for things. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so the, the first of Tishri is the Rashis Hashana because it commemorates Hayom Haras Elam the day the world was created, not the physical world, but the spiritual world of human beings with a neshama came into being on, on Rosh Hashanah. And then he goes on to say, Hayom Ya'amid Bamishpat, as we looked at in the first year, that the day of Rosh Hashanah is the day of, of Mishpat, Kol Yitzuri Olamim. All the creatures of the world are judged. Right? In other words, this was the day, the, the, uh, so here's an interesting thing. The world, the world is judged in Rosh Hashanah, and the Medrash wants to tell us that the reason for this is why did HaKadosh Baruch choose this day as the day of judgment? Because this was the day when Adam and Chava were created, and when Adam and Chava were created, the world had a spiritual purpose. Before Adam and Chabba were created, the world was the most magnificent creation, but it didn't have any spiritual purpose to it. There was no creature in the world that had a moral or ethical or spiritual component which gave the whole world a tachlis, right? When I say tachlis, I don't mean the word tachlis like your grandmother used the word tachlis, which meant when are you going to earn some money? What's the tachlis? When are you going to be able to actually earn some money? Tachlis means the actual purpose, the purpose of creation. Tachlis masa shamayim va'aretz, the creation of the, of the world, is human beings recognizing HaKadosh Baruch. When was the first moment that there were human beings who could recognize HaKadosh Baruch, recognize the power and the presence of God? That was on the Yom HaShishi, on the sixth day. And then HaKadosh Baruch who judges everybody on the sixth day on the, on the Rosh Hashanah to see how much the purpose of the world is really being uh, um, respected and being followed. We'll come back to that in a minute. But here in this tefillah, there is already a very beautiful um, additional phrase here. In kavonim, in ka'avodim. We stand before you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in kavodim, in ka'avodim. Look at this, either as your sons or as your servants. And this is a very interesting duality, which follows us through the whole of our tefillah, but particularly Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. 
that in certain respects we are avodim, we are servants of God, avdei Hashem, and a servant, the primary uh, virtue, if you like, of a servant is obedience. But the idea is to be obedient to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's laws, that is the servant. But then there is boni, children, and there the primary virtue is love. There's a love relationship between parents and children, right? Which doesn't exist between the king and his servants. The king and his servants are not supposed to love each other, right? The servant is supposed to follow orders, like a soldier. But the, between Ovas and Bonim, there is a different relationship, right? And this dual relationship, in Kavonim, in Ka'avodim, is really the foundation, for example, it's the foundation of the famous tefillah, Ovinu Malkeinu. What does it mean, Ovinu Malkeinu? It means our father, our king. Why do we mention Ovinu Malkeinu together, these two words together? Because these two words together capture in Kavonim, in Ka'avodim. That we have this dual relationship with our Kaddish Baruch Hu, that we are both Avodim and Bonim. In a sense, Bonim and Avodim is a difference between Yira and Ahava. Our Chazal mentioned a few times the two major modes, if you like, of our mitzvahs, of our tefillah and our mitzvahs and our service of our Kaddish Baruch Hu, is Yira and Ahava. Yira is the predominant feeling of I'm obligated to obey, full stop. Yiro, like a soldier, obeys his officer. But Ahava, the love, is something else completely. The love is to do it, believe Sholem, to do it, Simcha. Ahava relates to Simcha, to joy. So on Rosh Hashanah, we have both the Yiro and the Ahava, because it's in Kavonim, in Kavodim. Sometimes a Baruch relates to us as Bonim, as children, and that's a relationship of love. And then in Kavodim, sometimes it is, it, it is Kavodim, and we have to, in a sense, uh, uh, connect both of, these, uh, both of these together. The Vilna Gaon writes, and this is an interesting uh, insight, actually, uh, to, this, to this duality in Kavodim and Kavodim. He says that actually this is reflected, this duality is reflected in Jewish life in the following way. It says, when we are doing mitzvot, Right? When we are blowing the shofar, because it's a mitzvah to blow the shofar. Or we're saying Kriya Shema, putting talis and tefillin, keeping Shabbos, keeping Kashras. When we are doing the mitzvot, then we are avodim. Then we are servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, uh, and, and we are displaying our obedience to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that is Asher Kedoshanu, the mitzvot of the tzivon. That's the tzivon. But he says, there is a different mode of Jewish life. And that, interestingly, the Vilna Gaon says, is Talmud Torah. When we, when we engage in learning Torah, and we want to understand the meaning, and the logic, and the principles, and the significance of every word in the Torah, that, he says, is an act of Ahava. That's an act, that is Kavonim. When we are, we are the children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when we are learning his Torah, we want to understand Kaviyochol, how he thinks, right? But that is, so he says, the, the difference between Talmud Torah and doing mitzvahs, both of which are crucial uh, elements of Jewish life, is the difference between in Kavonim, in Ka'avodim. And that's why everybody should, in addition to the, living a life of mitzvahs, should be engaging, as we are doing actually during these shiurim. In, in engaging in, in, in an activity of Talmud Torah, of trying not just to do, but to understand. To understand what it is that we're doing, and to understand it. And the more you understand it, the more you can do it, believe Shalem, you can do it with a full heart and a full concentration. And this is really what happened at Har Sinai, says the Vilna Gaon, when Klal Yisrael said, Na'aseh v'nishma. Na'aseh means we'll do it because you told us to do it, because we're obedient. Nishma means, we want to understand what it's all about. Let us understand Shema in classical Hebrew doesn't just mean to listen, it means to understand. Shema Yisrael means understand, right? So Nase means we'll do, because we are, we are Vodim. And Nishma means we want to learn Torah, because we are also Boni. And this duality comes out very beautifully in this very short poem. We don't know as far as far, I, I couldn't find out anywhere, <coughs> excuse me.
We don't know exactly who was the author of this particular small tefillah, but the poetry is beautiful, and it exists already in the Siddur of Rav, Am, Rav Amram Gaon, which is more than a thousand years ago, the time of the Gaonim. Rav Amram Gaon had already had a Siddur which contained a few small piyutim, and this is one of the small piyutim in the Siddur of Amram Gaon, and I think it's a, beautiful, it's, a, it's a real gem, because it relates both to Hayom Haras Olam and in Kavonim, and, and so the, the, uh, he goes on to say here, in Kavonim, Rachameinu, Rachim, Monim, if you see us as your children, have mercy on us, have compassion on us, as, like a father has compassion on his children. That's our tefillah, right? As, as children of our Baruch Hu, we are able to ask for compassion, right? As simply a servant to a master, Compassion doesn't come into it. Either you've done well or you haven't. Uh, and if you haven't done well, then you're punishable. But with a, with a father, then a father has compassion. In Kavodim, if you view us as Kavodim, we are completely dependent on you. Our eyes are raised to you. Right? So in other words, if we are Avodim, then what we're asking for is the Akadosh Baruch Hu's uh, um, to right? Chonenu means Matnas Chinon, right? If you look at the opening Rashi in Parshas Bo'es Chanan, where Rashi says, Bo'es Chanan el Hashem, I dove into Akadosh Baruch Hu, says Rashi, Ein in Chinun el Matnas Chinon. That we're asking for a gift which is undeserved. That's what it means, Matnas Chinon. Undeserved. And this is also an interesting theme throughout our Tfilas. That what we're asking for, we don't ask ever f- for what we deserve. We always ask for chasdei Hashem, right? Gomel chasodim tovim v'konei hakol. That's how we start up our tefillas. That w- our, 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 our request is always that Hakadosh Baruch should view us with compassion, and we look for a matnat chinam. Even when we're benching gomel, for example, it's interesting when a person has been in a dangerous situation or a dangerous illness and is now benching Gomel, so we, 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 don't, we don't say, thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for looking after us. We say, HaGomel L'chayovim Tovas. What does it mean, L'chayovim? Chayovim means really we're undeserving. We are Chayov. Right? I, had this story finished differently, Chas Shalom, I would have been Chayov. I, would have, I was really, I, 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 I'm a recipient, of an undeserving recipient. Of Chazde Hashem, of the compassion and the Chesed of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and that all contained in this world, Adjet to Chonein. Okay, so this is Hayom Aras Olam, and here comes an interesting uh, piece of the Medrash. This is the Medrash Pirkei Drabeliezer. I've given you a little bit of a uh, edited version of it. It's the Medrash describing and relating to the first day that Adam and Eve were alive, the original Yom Hashishi. The original moment of Yom Hashishi, the original moment of creation, says the Medrash, were Ahmad Adam. Right? So the man, if you like, you can follow in the English, uh, that Adam Arisha understood, Mistakel Klape Malo Umato. So he was able to look both lamala and lamata. In other words, upwards and downwards, meaning he looked at downwards is the, the creation. He saw the mountains and the lakes and the fields and the trees and the animals. And lamala means he saw HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he, saw, he sensed the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. kol HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He saw everything that was created. V'ro'a tamea baliba. And he was Tamea. Tamea means he was amazed. He was amazed. He was wondering at, at the creation. And what did he do? Hitchil Meshabeach of Fo'el Yotzer, Ba'oma Marabu Masecho Hashem. So the Possum, Morabu Masecho Hashem, Kulam Bachachma Asiso, which we say every morning in Hamea the Oretz, Adam Arishan was able to recognize the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in nature, in nature. And I think many people have this experience 
you sometimes look at a mode of overpoweringly beautiful part of nature, and you can feel the presence of Akash Baruch Hu, you can see the wisdom of the Creator, you can see the power and the beauty of the, of, of the Creator. And the Rambam writes in Hilchas Yisod uh, in, in the very in the very very beginning in chapter two, it says one of the ways to Avas Hashem is to meditate on nature and, and look at to see in nature the hand of Akash Baruch Hu, the imprint of the divine wisdom. Right? If you look at either you look at the beauty of nature generally, or you look at the uh, at the, at the science of, of, of DNA and the living cell and, and the galaxies and everything, and you see the immensity of nature. This didn't happen by chance. Despite all the millions of scientists who try and tell us that nature, that the universe came to exist as a random, a random event, that is of course all nonsense. That is completely against our belief in gracious borrow of Kimas as arts. The world was created for a purpose. In uh, in the Bria. So he says, so that was, um, that was the moment that Odom Orishan, so one could say, we're getting a little bit of background noise here from somebody, um, I'm not sure exactly where it's coming from. One of the hazards of, of Zoom is that you pick up unwanted, unwanted noises um, uh, along the way. But certainly, um, the uh, uh, so it's an interesting thing. In other words, in fact, the the entire creation had been had been created by Kadosh Baruch Hu, and the purpose of creation had been that eventually there should come a creature, humanity who would be able to bring the Kedusha of HaKadosh Baruch Hu into this world, to see the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this world, and apply that Yerushamayim and that Emunah in our lives. That was the goal. That was the, that was the purpose of creation. When did that purpose start? When was it initiated? On that first day of Yom HaShishi. Adam and Chava, one can imagine the moment, Adam and Chava, open their eyes, look at the world, think about it, and then the Shama, the Tzalem al is functioning. They can say, I know, I can see. That this is the Yad Hashem. That this was the creation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that was the, and that is Rosh Hashanah. That was the moment of Rosh Hashanah. What's interesting is, the Medrashah goes on to say, um, At that moment, Odom Arishan opened his mouth. And all the creatures metaphorically joined him and saying, Here comes the important point. That at that moment, Odom Arishan was Mamlich HaKadosh Baruch. Mamlich means he acknowledged the presence of HaKadosh Baruch. Right? And what did he say? He said, Hashem Moloch Geus Lovesh. What is Hashem Moloch Geus Lovesh? Right? What is that? So we know what this Mizmor is, right? This is Hayom Yom Shishi B'Shabbos. Shabahoyim of the Omer Beis HaMikdash. Everyone who davens Shachris, at the end of Shachris, every day of the week, we have a different Mizmor. So this Medrash wants to explain to us why is it? Here's an interesting thought. Why is it that Dafka Tehillim 93 is the Mizmar for Yom Shishi, for Friday? Because it was on the Yom Shishi, the very, very first Yom Shishi, that Adam Harishan opened his eyes and he said for the first time, Hashem Moloch Geyuslovet. Hashem Moloch was the first word that Adam and Chavo said, when they recognize the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Bria, and that's what Malchus means. So in a sense, so let's, let's, let's just now review what we've just now said. We started off by saying that Rosh Hashanah was the anniversary of the creation of man. But now we can take it one stage deeper. 
wasn't only the anniversary of the creation of man, it's the anniversary of Malchus Shammai, the first time that any creature had understood that there was Malchus Shammai, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was the Melech HaOlam, that was Rosh Hashanah. And that's why in all our tefillas, the word Melech is the key word. On Rosh Hashanah, we are once again uh, following in the footsteps of Adam and Chava, and we are once again proclaiming Hashem Moloch Deus Lavesh, right? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the Melech, is the Melech HaOlam. So this, this, this medrash from Pinkish Rebbe Ezra really joins the dots in a very beautiful way. That on Rosh Hashanah, we're not only celebrating the creation, we're celebrating particularly the creation of man, and of the creation of man, we're particularly celebrating the fact that the human being, as a Tzalem Alakim, has an ability to recognize the hand of HaKadosh Baruch in this world and to live a spiritual life. And that began on Rosh Hashanah. And that's what the, uh, the, the moment of Rosh Hashanah uh, is really all about. So, so far, that's actually... So, so far, in a sense, that's the good news. The good news is that Odom Arishan has his neshama with Chava, and they look at the world, and they're able to say, Hashem Moloch Kei Uslavesh. That's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is that on that day as well, Odom and Chava committed an Avera. They sinned with the Eitz Hadas. They violated the, the mitzvah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them of eating from the Eitz Hadas. What exactly that is all about is the subject for separate shiurim. It's a complicated story. But one thing is for sure, it was a moment of an Avera. And you might say, well, it's an extraordinary story, this. Why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu give us a story in the Torah of Adam being created, recognizing HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and immediately doing an Avera? Right? But what's interesting about it from our point of view, of course, it's a, it's a very big subject, this, and I don't pret pretend for a minute to encompass the subject here this morning, but from our point of view, studying Rosh Hashanah, Yom Hadin, and Yom Im Neroim, what's really happening is that on the first day of the creation of man and woman, the human being showed himself to be imperfect, to be fallible. And human beings make mistakes and they do our virus. And HaKadosh Baruch initially says to him, most Thomas, as soon as you violate my commandment, that's it. You're finished, you'll die, right? But in actual fact, what happens is he gets din barachan. He gets a judgment, he is banished from Gan Eden, but he's allowed to live. He's allowed to live and build a family and have, have, have descendants and, and, and create the world, right? So what happens, so the first Yom Hashishi, which is the model for, the first, for, for Rosh Hashanah, is also the beginning of Malchus Shemayim. It's also a model for HaKadosh Baruch who's giving us a Yom Hadin, a day of judgment, Barachamin, with compassion. The compassion for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he judged the human beings and said, look, I created these, these creatures. I created them with Bechira, with freedom of choice. Inevitably, they're sometimes going to go wrong, right? Whenever you go wrong, there are consequences. There are always consequences if you go wrong. But it's not the end of the world. It's Rachamin Badim. It's Rah, you get, you get a compassionate judgment. We get a judgment where HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes into consideration the extenuating circumstances and the difficulties, whatever they are. So this Yom HaShishi is actually a very complicated model. It's worth thinking more about it in greater detail. We've only got a few minutes left of the Shia, but there's a lot more in this, uh, uh, in, in this model. If you want to understand Rosh Hashanah in depth, you have to analyze the very first Yom HaShishi. The beauty of the Yom HaShishi on the one hand, the beauty of the, f the, the first neshama starting to function and connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the moment of Hashem Moloch Deus Lovish, that moment of Malchus Shemayim, that's the beauty of it. The sad part of it is that he goes wrong, 
But that in itself is a wonderful model for mankind, for the rest of our, for the rest of, for the rest of human history. That even when we make mistakes, and even though we have done things in our life that we shouldn't have done, or things that we're not so proud of, right? And we're standing with our Baruch Yom Hadin, we're able to say, look, remember Adam Arishan. He went wrong. He's our ancestor. He did lots of good things. He recognized Malchus Shemayim. But he occasionally makes an error, and he regretted it, and he did tshuva. And we also want to do tshuva. Right? So in actual fact, the model of the first Yom HaShishi is at the root of Rosh Hashanah. And that's why this, this piyot by Yom Haras Elam is so exceptionally uh, uh, crucial for our understanding of, uh, of the day of Rosh Hashanah. So just to summarize the last few minutes of the Shia, what I want to share with you is the idea of the Yom HaZikaron. They were asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to remember us in our best light, to remember us for all the good things we've done. And by saying that, what we're really saying is, because that's the real me. The real me are the mitzvahs that I've done. The real me is the chesed that I've done. The real me is the shabbos and yontif that I've done. That's the real me. The other things that I've done, I've done because, you know what? Sometimes I'm stupid. Sometimes I'm impatient. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I'm influenced by the surroundings. There are things that happen, but that's not really me. And therefore, on Rosh Hashanah, we can turn to our Kodesh Baruch Hu and ask Zachreinu B'Zikoron Toib Lefana. Remember us for the good. Right? And in that sense, we can connect to the, to the, to the Akedah of Avraham Avinu, the peak moment of Emunah of Avraham Avinu, and say, we also have that Emunah in us. Is it there all the time? No, it isn't there all the time. But it is there, and it does occasionally work. Right? And therefore, we are still in the game. We are still the descendants of Abraham Avinu, the descendants of Adam Arishan, who, who made it, did it hate, but was given a Yom Hadin Barachabe. And that's our Tfilah of Rosh Hashanah. Zachreinu Lachayim, Mele Chofetz Pachayim. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Chofetz Pachayim. He wanted Abram, he wanted Adam and Chabad to continue living. He could have said, right, that's it, you've done an Avera, zap, we're, we're returning the whole world to Tohu Vavohu. Everything is going to go, but he didn't. He said, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to, it's not going to be a world which is run on the basis only of din. It's going to be din barachad. It's going to be compassion of din. And that is our tefillah um, uh, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for this morning. It's nice to see you all here. And it's nice to uh, have a chance to review Rosh Hashanah and look at some of the Mamori Chazal. Is it Shabbos? It's, uh, um, please, God, we're on next week, are we, Ellie? Yes, yes, we're on next week. Anybody wishes to un unmute themselves? One second. Yes, you can unmute yourselves if you like. Unmute and, uh, themselves. They may unmute themselves. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kim It was very appreciated. A wonderful share. Um, remind everyone. Um, one second. I seem to have lost. Thank you, Rabbi Sabri. Are you unmuted, Rabbi? And now I've unmuted myself. But you right, okay. okay, fine, fine. Unmute, unmute everybody. It's no, nice thank, to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Anybody yeah, else who wishes to um, uh, sponsor another share, please can they uh, return the email that I sent them uh, with the invitation and just say, yes, I'd like to sponsor a share because we are sponsoring these year and rather than charging everyone 20 pence or whatever it is might be in your in your own currency so it's still in pence it could be in farthings <laughs> yeah. it's a long time since i've been back in england we're not allowed to right, die right so my memory is a distant thank you so much I mean, everyone and everyone please enjoyed week. it and uh, please god we will continue